Well, thank you, Shusheng. Um, I'd like to thank Shusheng for inviting me to talk with you today. Um, as he mentioned, I did my graduate work in the department, and right now I have a lot of memories <laughs> flooding back. <laughs> a lot of good memories, except when my experiments didn't work. But, um, <laughs> but um, and it's, I'm really, it's wonderful to see Lisa here. Thank you. Thank you for coming. So what I'm going to tell you about today are some of the work that I've been doing um, at the Boyce Thompson Institute, and primarily with the Solanaceae. Um, this, now, this is the correct color. <laughs> that is not the correct color. <laughs> so the tomatoes aren't black. There, that's not. We didn't do that. That's not okay. There they are. Um, so I'm going to give you some background on the Solanaceae family. I wasn't sure how many of you are familiar with the Solanaceae, so I have a couple of slides to give you some information. I'll then tell you about some of the tissue culture and transformation work we've been doing. In the interest of time, I'm going to focus on tomato and potato because that's where we spend most of our time anyway. Then I'll follow that with genome editing. I have several slides to give some background on the CRISPR technology because I, I didn't know how many of you are familiar with CRISPR and I didn't want to jump into talking about our work without including those. So I have some background information. And then I'll also talk about our work with tomato <laughs> and genome editing. Okay, so the Solanaceae is made up of more than 3,000 species. It's an economically important family. Uh, I've been working with the Solanaceae since I was an undergraduate, and I'm still amazed by the amount of biodiversity that exists in this family. I mean, in tomatoes alone, you know, they're different shapes, sizes, colors. And um, as a result of that diversity, there are multiple uses um, for the species in this family. There are food crops, you know, the major ones are tomato, potato, eggplant, and pepper. There are also medicinal compounds that are extracted from, um, from Solanaceae species. And this is by no means the entire list. It's just what I could fit on the slide. And it's just showing a couple examples. And Physalis is actually one of the more recent uh, Solanaceae species where they're looking uh, for medicinal um, compounds. They're also used for models for plant research, tobacco, benthamiana, and tomato had you know, fast becoming a good model species for doing uh, all types of research. The ornamentals, um, petunias. Actually, petunias could also fit up in this model for plant research. Brewalia, and one of my favorites is salpiglossus. And this is, well, you can't see it there, but it's actually a really pretty color, maroon color. It's also a great resource for doing education and outreach. Um, I was on the Tomato Genome Sequencing Project, which is funded by the NSF Plant Genome Program. And one of our outreach activities was geared towards students in the elementary, uh, the elementary school age. And we used to go into the classroom, into after school programs, and I would go to Wegmans and buy as many different soul family <laughs> members I could find. And then we would um, cut those up and have the kids taste them, except for the hot peppers. We didn't cut up the hot peppers. We didn't let them touch the hot peppers. Um, and it was really interesting to see kind of the peer pressure. Are you going to taste it? No. Uh, OK, I'll taste it. And, and it turned out that tomatillos were one of their favorites, which was, which was surprising. Um, I also got um, purple potato chips and salsa to kind of reinforce that idea of where their food comes from. And we talk about plant biodiversity, plant relatedness, uh, the multiple uses of the family, where their food comes from. And in the end, to reinforce that idea of a family and relatedness, we dressed up the family for a family reunion. Uh, <laughs> so that, <laughs> that was, yeah, it was, it was really, I really enjoyed it. Um, unfortunately, when the sequencing project ended a couple of years ago, so did this outreach activity. And um, if anyone is interested in continuing it, I have a whole box of hats and hair and feathers that <laughs> you're, welcome, you're welcome to have. Um, but I got a really good feedback from the kids and also from the parents of the children. So we knew we were having, having an impact. So for the Solanaceae family members that we have worked with in our lab, they include eggplant. We've worked at a, a tissue culture and transformation method for eggplant. Tobacco and benthamiana are primarily, as I mentioned, used as a model. And this is part of our transformation uh, service uh, activities, where people give us constructs, we do the transformations, and then we provide the plants. Uh, a lot of people, of course, are interested in using them as a model. We're working on pepper. Pepper is, in my experience, is, being, is more difficult of the Solanaceae family members um, for transformation. We have some preliminary results which look promising, but there's definitely more work that needs to be done. The physalis, I'm getting, I'm kind of fascinated with the physalis right now. They are, uh, contain the ground cherries, uh, there's Cape gooseberry here, and, all, oops, and also tomatillos. 
Solanum prinophyllum is one that we've been working with most recently, and it's a member of the spiny Solanaceae. And I don't know if you can see this, but the name Solanace spiny Solanaceae, oops, spiny Solanaceae is definitely um, a good term for them. Okay, I just need to go back. Oh, I, I, I'm kind of like trying to look at different, <laughs> different screens here. Okay. Um, and even in tissue culture, those little plants have those spines on them. So it's pretty amazing. Right from the very start, we can, we can see those spines. Um, Harry Nightshade was a collaboration with Stuart Gray and a visiting scientist in his lab. We by far spend most of our time working with tomato. We have worked with some wild species. We worked with Penelii in the past, and most recently with Pimpinella folium. And the Pimpinella folium is working very well um, for transformation. So I'm going to start out by telling you about how we do potato transformation and then give you an example of a project that we have ongoing in the lab right now. So for potato, we start with in vitro potato plants. And we use the stem pieces here in between the leaves. And those stem pieces, we get the plants from the potato gene bank. We get a, they'll, give us, they'll send us like three plants. We then have to propagate those plants to bulk up to the number of plants we need um, as a source for material. They're cultured on a medium, and this medium contains a gelling agent, salts to support plant growth, sugar. And then we take the stem pieces, and we incubate them with an agrobacterium overnight liquid culture. And that culture is centrifuged. We get a pellet. We wash the pellet with a, a plant tissue culture medium. And then we um, have what, and what that agrobacterium contains is a vector. It contains or a construct. And this is an example of a basic vector. So that vector has um, a left border and a right border sequence. And those are the sequences that agrobacterium recognizes to cut and transfer that DNA that's in between those borders. For um, a vector for plant transformation, we have a selectable marker cassette here. And this is an example where we have NPT2. And NPT2 confers resistance to an antibiotic called canamycin. And the other part of this vector, um, a commonly used promoter, is the 35S promoter. And that could drive your uh, gene of interest, which I indicated here. So that vector is a plasmid DNA, is electroporated into the agrobacterium. We grow that overnight liquid culture I showed you. And then we do the transformation. So these stem pieces are what's incubated with the agrobacterium. They, are, they go through what's there. They're just with the agrobacterium for like five minutes, just enough to coat them. And then for two days, they go through something called a co-cultivation period. And that's when the agrobacterium attaches and transfers that DNA into the cells. And then in, um, after that co-cultivation period, they go to a plant regeneration medium. And that medium contains growth regulators to give the signal to make plants. It contains canamycin in this case, and also an antibiotic to keep down the agrobacterium growth. Because if we didn't include that, the agrobacterium would overgrow those plant pieces and kill them. When the plants are about a centimeter tall, we cut them and we put them on medium. This medium also contains canamycin, because it's a, it's a layer of verification that these plants are indeed transformed. If they root, we then do PCR and we move the PCR positive lines to soil. In this case, we use these little jiffy peat pots, but you could just put them in a pot with soil, and they'll do perfectly fine. We cover those plants with a dome, because when they're in those plant tissue culture containers, it's like 100% humidity. The cuticle doesn't develop very well. The stomates are open. They're transpiring. Um, if we didn't cover them, they would wilt and die. So we cover them with these domes for about a week, and then we gradually prop up those domes to give them a gradual acclimation to the real world. Um, in about three to four months, depending on the potato genotype, we can recover tubers. And that's kind of fun. You know, I first started working with potato was when I came to BTI, that they actually will make potatoes in pots. And, and, um, and you can see them all misshapen and dig in and see if they're there. Um, so it's been, it was, you know, it's, been, it's been a lot of fun um, working with potatoes. So the whole process from the time of when we infect the stem pieces to recovering tubers takes about six to seven months. So you have to be pretty patient um, when you're doing plant tissue culture. It's not E. coli. You, know, you don't get your results in a couple of days. Um, but if you're interested in disease or insect you know, resistance screening, 
you know, that cuts that time off because you don't need the tubers. You could just use the whole plants. <laughs> So as a summary, as I know I've gone, um, hit you with a lot of information, um, we use the internodal stem explants from those in vitro plants. We inoculate them with agrobacterium that go through a two-day co-cultivation period. They're transferred to a plant regeneration medium with a selection agent. It could be an antibiotic, an herbicide resistance, depend, a, an herbicide component, depending on the resistance gene that you used. And then they go to a rooting medium. Now, the transformation efficiency ranges from about 10 to 40 percent for potato. And that transformation efficiency is defined as the number of independent transgenic lines that we can recover from a certain number of explants. So for instance, if we infect 100 stem pieces and we recover 10 independent transgenic lines, that's a 10 percent transformation efficiency. And that efficiency can be affected by the vector, um, the gene of interest, the selection agent. We primarily work with canamycin and hygromycin. Bialophos is an herbicide component, and we've actually had to change our protocol in order to recover plants um, when they have this resistance. So we prefer to not use that. And unlike tomato, the potato genotype really can have an effect on success or failure in transformation and tissue culture, actually. So we use Desiree a lot in our lab because it works so well. And we have used Russet Burbank, but I learned the hard way that not every Russet Burbank clone is the same. So if you're going to work with Russet Burbank, we had one Russet Burbank line that we got in a collaboration with the company. It worked beautifully. But when that contract ended, we had to destroy the plants. And I thought, okay, I'll just get you know, more potato from the potato gene bank. I'll get more Russet Burbank. And there was nothing. It didn't, it didn't work at all. So we had to screen other clones and tweak the medium um, to get it to work. So, so although it seems like every step just, just worked out perfectly, there's a lot of work that goes into developing that, that method. So as an example of where we're using genetic engineering um, for potato, I have a collaboration with a group at the Danforth Plant Science Center. And we're looking at um, enhancing the beta carotene, actually having them produce beta carotene and enhancing the iron content. And the way this collaboration came about is the Danforth Center was curious about using potato as a model for cassava. You know, they primarily work with cassava, and that takes an incredibly long time to recover transgenic lines. So what they were hoping was that they could screen their gene constructs in potato first, which is much quicker, and then anything that looks promising in potato, they could then use that in cassava instead of transforming every construct into cassava. And this um, is just an example here of some images of some potatoes that we harvested. Um, this is a transgenic line where we had overexpression of two enzymes in the carotenoid pathway. And you can definitely see the difference in color between the control and those transgenic lines. And these are being analyzed right now for beta carotene content. Um, I'm pretty excited to see the results. Um, I can tell that there's definitely a change in the carotenoids, but I'm not sure, we don't know yet about the beta carotene. Um, on that, so okay. I'm talking too much. Okay, so that's that's potato, and now I'm going to move on to tomato. So the steps are somewhat similar to potato um, for tomato, but we have a different starting material, and that's what it is in plant tissue culture transformation. You never know where your best starting material is going to come from. So for tomato. We um, start with seeds that are germinated on a culture medium. Again, the medium has a gelling agent, salts, sugar. When those seedlings are six to eight days old, we collect the cotyledons and we cut them and we put them onto medium. Now you'll see here there's an image um, with a piece of filter paper pulled up. And what that is is some tobacco cells um, that are used as a nurse or a feeder layer for the tomato the cotyledons. And this, this method was in place when I first came to BTI. And when I got there, I thought, do we really need this feeder layer? We have to maintain a cell suspension. We have to plate it out, make special medium. So we did a comparison with and without the feeder layer. And it didn't make a difference when we had constructs that were easy to recover plants from. But for those difficult constructs where we really struggled to get transgenic lines, the feeder layer really didn't make a difference. And what it does is it kind of helps those cotyledons through the stress of agrobacterium infection. Um, so we, we include it as a routine part of our method because we never know when we're going to have a difficult um, construct to work with. 
Those um, cotyledon pieces are what are incubated with the overnight liquid culture of agrobacterium. Um, the two-day cool cultivation period, and then they go to a regeneration medium. And as I mentioned, there's a cassette in there for a selectable marker gene. And if we didn't have that selectable marker gene and then include the selection agent in the medium, we would have a whole lot more plants that we would have to screen to find our transgenic lines. So when you use those vectors with the selectable marker gene, only the cells that receive that vector go on to divide and regenerate because that medium contains something like canamycin for can to um, select those cells that are canamycin resistant. When the plants are big enough to cut away from the cotyledons, we transfer them to a rooting medium. This contains, in this instance, canamycin. If they're indeed transformed, they should root. And as you can see, these are some control plants. Did not go through transformation. They're not rooting in the medium, but this transgenic line that we recovered is. Similar with um, potato, we'll do PCR. They're transferred to the greenhouse. Um, in this case, we use these highly technical juice bottles. Actually, we collect those from the lab, and we, you know, we people with their kids, and uh, we cut the lids, uh, cut the tops off, and we just reuse these bottles. Uh, they're covered for about a week, and then in about 10 to 12 weeks, we have um, ripe tomatoes on those lines. It can depend on the genotype, but again, if you were just interested in looking at plant growth or some sort of resistance um, gene, you could certainly cut that time and just look at the plants um, themselves and do the testing. The whole um, time from the time of infection to recovering fruit takes about seven to eight months, roughly the same time frame as, um, as potato. Recently, we've tweaked the protocol and we've actually cut a month off this by making some changes. And we do transformations, especially as our service component, people are anxious um, to get their lines. So we looked at ways to be able to shorten the time, and we've cut a month off um, this method. Uh, just about two or three months ago, we, we finalized that. OK, so um, in summary, we germinate seeds in vitro. We use um, cotyledons. We pre-culture those one day before. They're inoculated with the agrobacterium. They're transferred to plant regeneration medium, kind of sounds familiar, same with potato, and then they go to a selective rooting medium. The efficiency for tomato uh, ranges from 10 to 90%. Um, again, it, this depends on the same sort of things depended on for potato. But as I mentioned before, unlike potato, where the genotype really, it can make it difficult with tomato, I don't know, I should have kept track of how many different genotypes we've done over the years, but except for two that come to mind, which we were able to recover plants, but not, not quite so many, we really haven't had a difficult time, even with the wild species, recovering transgenic lines from that. And uh, one example of a, was a fun project, we actually had a collaboration with Steve Tanksley a number of years ago, and Steve's group, um, you know, we're pretty certain that they ha had identified a gene that controlled fruit shape in tomato. And one of the best ways to confirm that is to do a transformation. So they gave us um, a construct containing that gene that they um, had identified as being involved in fruit shape. We transformed a yellow pear, which you can see is a yellow pear shape. So the idea was that if this gene really was involved, that the fruit should be round instead of pear shape. And we were, you know, patiently awaiting, the, we saw the flowers and we saw the fruit. And sure enough, those fruit were round um, instead of pear-shaped on the plant. So, you know, genetic engineering, you know, is not, it's not can just be used as producing a product, but also a great tool in the lab for, you know, looking at gene function. All right, with that, I'm now going to move into CRISPR, um, Cas9, and our work in tomato. So I wasn't sure how many of you are familiar with, um, as I mentioned, the CRISPR-Cas9 system. So I have some slides to give you some background to bring everybody up to speed before I jump into talking about our work in tomato. So there are, currently there are three genome editing technologies available. There are zinc finger nucleases, which the first publication was in 2002, um, talons in 2009. These are, are based on a protein DNA interaction. Whereas CRISPR, where the first report was in 2012, is a, an RNA sequence to DNA sequence um, mode of editing. And again, I'm not going to go into detail on the uh, zinc finger nucleases and talons. I'm going to focus on the, the CRISPR. So in the beginning, um, this is how it all started. So it didn't start out as a genome editing um, methodology. That came about over a number of years. So in 1987, a group of Japanese scientists 
you know, the, the E. coli they were working with, they, they I saw, they observed some of these strange repetitive DNA sequences in the E. coli. And then um, in 2002, this group, this is about the time when databases are, came available, and they were doing a search for conserved regions in prokaryotes. And they, they also saw these repetitive sequences um, in the DNA. And then over the years, they continued to work on it, and so did other groups. And what they um, termed it was CRISPR, and this is what it stands for. Um, they determined that these were viral sequences, and they were associated with proteins that they called Cas. And originally, they thought that they were involved in repair of DNA within the bacteria. But over time, and again, um, more people working on this, um, there was kind of a more definitive mode of action for this that was reported in 2007. So there were a group of scientists working at a yogurt company. And uh, bacterial cultures that are used to make yogurt are especially prone to infection by viruses. And they were looking for a better way to make yogurt. And they found that some of the strains that they were looking at were actually resistant to the viruses. And by you know, going in and doing some research, and they determined that what this CRISPR-Cas system was was a, an adaptive immune system. So, so the bacteria, they had this CAS, CRISPR-Cas system, and the Cas would break up these viral sequences. They would get incorporated into the genome. And then it was a memory of you know, a future infection. And it was an immune system. And that's what they had, you know, they, they termed it now. Is it an immune system, not a DNA repair mechanism within the bacteria? Okay? So up until now, you know, no idea that this could be used for genome editing. But then in 2012, Jennifer Dowden's group at the University of California, Berkeley, published a paper that showed that this could indeed um, be used for genome editing. And what they focused on was a system um, they call it Cas9. And this was in the Streptococcus. And as a reminder, this is uh, an RNA-guided immune system. And for the genome editing, what they found was you design a single guide RNA that's complementary to a DNA sequence that you want to target. And you target a 20 base pair uh, DNA sequence with this guide RNA. It'll make more sense. I have a schematic on the next slide um, to show you. So this Cas9 causes double-stranded breaks in the DNA. Uh, it recognizes something called a protospace or adjacent motif, or PAM. For this Cas9, that PAM is an NGG sequence that's at the end of your DNA sequence. So that N could be A, T, C, or G. And it's through the repair um, of those, that DNA sequence that you get insertions or deletions. And that in interferes with gene expression. So like you know, any other you know, mutagenesis method, it, causes a, it can cause a break, and then through the repair, you get disruption of gene expression. So this is a, one of my favorite schematics to show um, how this kind of comes together. So this here in blue, this blob, is the Cas9 enzyme. The target DNA is indicated here in yellow, and the red is that protospacer, that PAM, the NGG. The orange is your complementary guide RNA, so that's the RNA that matches the DNA sequence. And when the PAM recognizes, when the Cas9 recognizes that PAM, it cuts about three base pairs up from that recognition sequence. So you have those cuts, double stranded break, through DNA repair, you get insertions, deletions, and that's your mutation. All right. So the repair mechanisms can be through. Uh, non-homologous end joining, which is the primary mode in plants, or through homology-directed repair. This is the primary mode in mammalian cells. Um, for this um, homology-directed repair, this happens through recombination at a target locus, and you need to supply uh, template DNA. There are um, groups right now who have reported the HDR mode of uh, repair in plants, and I think as time goes on, we're going to see more and more uh, strategies for um, using this in plants, because there are advantages to going in and not just making a cut and a mutation, but able to do gene replacement or um, some other sort of uh, strategy. So again, the CRISPR-Cas9 is you know, a really good site-directed mutagenesis tool. I see it's like drone-like. It goes right in where you want it to. Um, there's been rapid development because of all the genome sequences that are available. There are guide um, RNA design programs available online. One of my favorites is the CRISPR-P. It's you know, de designated just for plants. 
Um, the trans and the one of the you know one of the I should say coolest. That's not what I want to say, but it is. Is that you can make this mutation in your primary transgenics, and then when you go through the next generation by screening those plants, you can select plants that just have the mutation and don't have any part of that vector, which you know causes issues for genetic engineering sometimes. But in these plants, you can see that modification, and it just looks like any other mutant that you might create. So that's a really big advantage of, of using this as a, of genome editing and using this as a tool. There have been reports of tens to hundreds of base pairs. There's an entire, there's a report on an entire gene cluster in rice that was deleted. You can do multiplex genome editing, meaning that you can target different genes within one construct. This has actually been done in plants and, and mammalian cells. Your mammalian cell work is actually leading the way, but the plant work uh, right now, you can do multiplex genome editing. But one thing that and people need to be aware of is there's this possibility of what's called off-targeting, and that means that you can, um, you know, not only are you mutating your gene, but there's a possibility of mutating a similar gene in the genome. Um, but it's, it's, from what I've seen in the, public, in the literature, it's rare in plants. It's more uh, of an incidence in mammalian cells. Um, but there are different strategies right now to uh, decrease the incidence of that um, off-targeting especially in, in plants. Okay, now I'm going to tell you about um, our tomato project. So I was dying to try this. And um, actually, I talked with Adam about doing talons, and then we talked about doing CRISPR. And uh, one of the perfect projects for it was a collaboration I have with Zach Lippman at the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory and with Mike Schatz. And the, um, the, the project is to look at genes and gene networks involved in meristem maturation, the conversion of meristem, vegetative meristems to floral meristems, and, and to look at branching with kind of the end goal to be, are there ways to increase yield? And we're using tomato as a model. And we've been using, we had been using up until this point, RNAi for our reverse genetics approach. So through um, laser dissection, um, we're going through meristems at different stages, identifying genes of interest, and then developing RNAi constructs. So we wanted to make this leap to the CRISPR-Cas9, but we wanted to do something that was going to convince us that it was really working. So I told Zach, I, I didn't want to target a gene that we're going to have to do any analysis, put it in the greenhouse to look at fruit. I wanted to see it right in the Petri plate because I wanted to make that decision soon. And as I get older, I get less patient, and I just wanted to see it with little, very little work involved. So we decided to um, recreate something called the tomato wiry mutant. And there is a, it's a recessive trait. And it was first described in 1928. And it was further characterized on a molecular basis in 2012. And what they found, this group found, is that disruption in any of these genes caused this wiry phenotype. And Zach and I decided to target the AGO7, the Argonite 7, in tomato. So I didn't think I'd be able to download a publication from 1928, but sure enough, I was. It's all in black and white. It's very refreshing to read a paper from back then, very straightforward, no gels, no DNA sequence. <laughs> um, it was, but it was an elegant paper describing this uh, mutant. So this is a tomato plant. And you can see that it's got these wiry, almost grass-like leaves. This is the um, wild type control. Um, and this is the wiry mutant. And this is you know, the wild type. And this is the mutant. It also, oops, it also affects the flowers. You can see you get these strap-like petals. Whereas in the um, wild type plant, you see these um, normal petals. And it also affects the fertility. So there's very little pollen that's produced in these mutants. Not surprising. So what we did was we um, got vectors from Sofian's lab, which are now available through an organization called Adgene. We decided to use two guide RNAs instead of just one single guide RNA, because we wanted to make sure this first time was going to be a hit, that we were going to make a large enough deletion that we could see a change in the phenotype. So what I have here is just um, part of the AG07 sequence. The red indicates the target DNA that we uh, chose for our, our, our target sequence. And then the GGG is that PAM. So you can see we have the DNA targets and then the PAM. So we made the constructs. And this is an example of a construct. Again, we have those left and right borders that I mentioned. This is the Cas9, so it's that endonuclease, and it's being driven by the 35S promoter. 
The uh, guide RNAs are being driven by the Arabidopsis RNA polymerase U6, polymerase U6 promoter. Just like any other uh, construct or vector, we electroporate that into agrobacterium. And we did the transformation experiment. And um, as I've said before, you know, it's rare in a career, well, it's rare in my career, <laughs> where anything works just as you imagine, and it worked the first time. So there were other plants in here in this plate, but we removed them to be able to take a picture to show this strap-like um, wiry leaves. I was going through the institute showing whoever cared um, <laughs> that, that it worked. And um, we then took those plants and we transferred them to rooting medium. They did indeed root. This is the wild type here, M82. These are two of the CRISPR lines. We transferred them to the greenhouse, um, the poor little things, um, but um, really grew attached to them. Um, and then 48% uh, of the plants, actually it was pretty high, it was higher than we expected, but 48% of the plants had that expected wiry phenotype, which was, which was very exciting for us, that we saw, we saw so many when we weren't expecting much. Um, so that was a pretty good, pretty good number. So there are several methods that you can use to um, analyze for that, um, that, it, that it worked. So what we chose to do is a PCR-based analysis. And these are the T0 lines. So these are our primary transformants. We designed primers to span that area that we made the deletion. And we did the PCR. And in the interest of time, I'm just going to focus on this one plant. So we did the PCR. Um, we also included primers for the Cas9 here, or here, through the Cas9. Um, as you can see, the wild type, it's a band that's slightly higher than 300 base pairs. But in this uh, plant number one, we actually saw a 90 base pair deletion. We then took the, um, that band and uh, did sequencing on it, eluded out the DNA. We actually did that for all of them, um, eluded out the DNA, sequenced it, and I guess we have to go over here. And what you can see is this is the um, sequence from the wild type. Um, there's the PAM, and then the sequence that we targeted. And um, indeed, what would you would expect is that the PAM, that the Gus, uh, Cas9, cut three base pairs up from that sequence and made that 90 base pair deletion. Um, and and um, so that you know, proved that we did indeed have the deletion where we targeted, and that's considered a homozygous um, result. When, you do the, when we do the CRISPR-Cas9, you can get what's called a homozygous um, mutations, biallelic or chimeric, and that depends on where and when the um, mutagenesis happened in the process of the regeneration. And as you can see here, we did really cover a, gam you know, a wide gamut of um, different types of deletions. We selected two of these lines, and we did crosses with M82 because, again, as I mentioned, the amount of pollen is very small. We grew up these plants to look at the next generation, and uh, it was pretty exciting because for one of the lines, with all the plants we looked at, uh, we didn't get many seed because, again, it's the low fertility. But of those five plants, none of them contained the Cas9 or any part of the vector. It was just the mutation. One of the other lines, I think it might have been one of the biallelic lines, um, we actually had some that still had the Cas9 and others that did not. So it showed us that in the next generation, we were able to see just that mutagenized um, low area and no, no other part of the vector. So once we had that transformation under our belt, we went ahead, we even remade some of our RNAi constructs because we felt like with the RNAi and doing our reverse genetics approach, we weren't seeing a clear phenotype. Right now, I think we've made about 50 or so CRISPR constructs for this project. And one of those, which was, um, which was fun, was this Clavada 3. So Clavada 3 works with Wuschel in this, um, this kind of circuit to control stem cell proliferation in the meristem. So if you, I mean, there are a number of genes involved, but if you, if you remove Clavada 3, that control over stem cell proliferation, we should get you know, no control and see a larger flower and larger fruit. That was the hypothesis. So when we went ahead and we did the transformations, it, it worked beautifully. Um, what you can see here is in the M82 wild type, this anther cone is narrow, but in the Clavada 3, it's, it's much wider, and that's because there's, there are more carpels in that, in that flower, and the carpels translate into locules in the fruit. Um, we did carpal counts on these flowers. This is the M82 wild type fruit, and this is um, 
what looks like a little pumpkin um, in the um, Clavata three line. And those, uh, that, there are more carpels, and hence there are more locules in that fruit, which gives it that shape. And in this instance, 63% had the phenotype that we were, we were expecting, so even higher than the, um, the wiry. That's black, but don't look at that one. This is, <laughs> um, so, um, so we let the fruit go to ripen, and um, this, this fruit got much bigger. This is the M82 fruit here, and this is the Clovata III, um, one of the mutants. M82 is a processing tomato, so it's very meaty. And even in the Clovata III, we uh, maintained that meatiness inside in the tomato. So we're not just generating plants for fun. Actually, it is fun. We are doing analysis, some downstream analysis on these plants, looking at the next generations. And what, you know, for Clovata III to function normally, it needs to have three arabinose residues. And that's what helps in that Wuschel Clovata III and that Clovata III control over that meristem growth. What we saw in these mutants, what happened was, is they were um, mutated in these arabinosal transferase genes. And what, as, was, as a result, there were no arabinose residues on this Clovata III. And what happened is it removed that control over the stem cell proliferation. And that was very exciting to us because it showed that link between um, a meristem size and a fruit size. And if you're interested in reading more about this, we have a, a publication in Nature Genetics. I was curious if the um, CRISPR system could be used for transient analysis. Um, this, is, this is not generating stable transformants, but infiltrating leaves with the CRISPR, cast, CRISPR um, vector to see if we could see some sort of phenotype. So we targeted the phytoin uh, desaturase gene, whereas if that was knocked out, we should see chlorosis in the leaves. So we made that construct. We infiltrated um, tomato leaves just by taking a syringe and infiltrating that agro into the leaves. And you can see here, um, the PDS plants had this chlorosis, whereas the vector only, meaning it was the CRISPR vector, but without the PDS um, target in it. And we compare that with an RNAi PDS vector construct, and you can see there's definitely not as much of a knockdown um, as there is in the PDS, and this is the vector only control. So you can imagine if um, possibly you're designing different CRISPR methodologies and you want to test it transiently, you might be able to use something like this to test your CRISPR constructs and your CRISPR designs. And that took about two weeks to see the, um, the change in the, in the color. So in summary, um, you know, we've been able to work with a number of uh, Solanaceae members in the, in the lab. Pepper, as I mentioned so far, has been the most problematic. But we still have some um, early results that looks like it, it could be working. We just need to tweak the system some more. We've shown efficient CRISPR-Cas9 editing in tomato. Um, it's been a great tool for doing a reverse genetics approach and a targeted approach in the genes that we're interested in and actually was more effective than RNAi. Uh, we've even reduced our population sizes. When we were using RNAi, we had to look at a much larger number of plants uh, in order to see a phenotype of interest. But with the CRISPR-Cas9, we've cut it down to uh, more than half of what we, what we have to look at. And also the agro-infiltration of CRISPR-Cas9 uh, worked quite well um, for the tomato. So for future activities, there are, of course, new CRISPR methodologies available for activation and repression of endogenous genes, for gene insertion and replacement. There are even ones where you can now, you can induce the mutation to happen. Um, I'd also, so the goal of our NSF project with Zach and Mike Schatz at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory is what we find in tomato to try this in other Solanaceae, other Solanaceae species to see if we see a, uh, an effect. Right now we have something going in pepper, but it's too soon to tell. We'll continue to develop that pepper transformation method, and we're doing both annuum and also chinense. And sort of a crazy idea I'd like to do is try so we've been, we've been working with grape recently because it's, you know, it's something I've been working, wanting to work with for a while. It's an important New York State crop. We're working out a transformation method um, for it. And I'd like to see if, there, if there's anything that might be of interest that we found in tomato to put into grape um, to give that a try. But I need funding, so this is a shameless ad for it. If anyone wants to collaborate, <laughs> um, I, I, would I would love to do this. And with that, um, I'd like to thank my group who make, make it all possible. Um, Zach and Mike Schatz at um, Cold Spring Harbor on the NSF project, Sofiane and Vlad for providing 
those CRISPR vectors even before they were available and also giving us guidance on making our first CRISPR constructs. Um, the group at the Danforth Plant Science Center for the potato work, um, Stuart and Han Hu Jung at Cornell, we did that hairy nightshade, which was, which was fun. Our funding, and then I used a number of photos, and these are some acknowledgments on the photos. And thank you.